Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to this panel discussion on Black sexuality, the church and living faith, the Black church and radical theology hosted by the Gilead Faith Coordinating Center at Wake Forest University School of Divinity. For all of you who are joining us, uh, we are streaming live from Facebook. So be sure to click and share. Um, also note that we are not streaming from YouTube. So be sure to direct your friends, colleagues, and church people, church members to the Facebook Live if they did not register for this event. I want to take a moment to acknowledge and thank the Gilead Compass Initiative for their support. Launched in 2018, the Gilead Compass Initiative started a 10-year, $100 million commitment to address HIV and AIDS in the Southern United States with three goals in mind change public perception related to HIV in the Southern United States, to increase local leadership and advocacy, and to increase access to quality and care. And to sustain these efforts uh, to work with partners, the Gilead Compass uh, Coordinating Centers were established to further the work and to also uh, uh, support local organizations and the Southern HIV Fund uh, to reach those who have been disproportionately affected by HIV and AIDS. I also want to uh, wish a happy Founders Day uh, to the Lynx Incorporated. We are grateful for your partnership, uh, particularly with the Athens, Georgia chapter of the Lynx and the leadership of the chapter president, Shana Jackson Sheets. Uh, friends, I am Shonda Jones. I am the uh, principal investigator and founder for the Faith Coordinating Center at Wake Forest University School of Divinity. Uh, and let me, let me call the roll right now of our esteemed panelists. Um, I will first just let you know who they are and, and, and uh, what they are doing. Um, I'll start by introducing Reverend Dr. Pamela R. Lightsey who's an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church and vice president of academic affairs and student affairs at an associate professor of constructive theology at Meadville Lombard Theological Seminary in Chicago, Illinois. Also want to introduce uh, Bishop O.C. Allen III, who is senior pastor and founder of the Vision Church of Atlanta and executive director of the Vision Community Foundation. Welcome Bishop. I also want to welcome the very Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union and the Bill and Judith Moyers Chair in Theology at Union Theological Seminary. She also serves as the Canon Theologian at Washington National Cathedral and Theologian Resident at Trinity Church Wall Street. Also uh, welcome to the conversation, Reverend Quincy Reinhardt, who is an ordained minister an adjunct professor of Africana Studies at Morehouse College uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, and also a PhD candidate in African-American religious history at Chicago Theological Seminary. And last but not least, the Reverend Naomi Washington Leaphart, who's an ordained minister affiliated with the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries and the United Church of Christ, uh, an adjunct uh, faculty member in uh, the Theology and Religious Studies Department at Villanova University and Director for Faith-Based and Interfaith Affairs in, for the City of Philadelphia. I hope you will join me in our virtual audience in welcoming our esteemed panel. Before we start this discussion, let me con contextualize why we are here. Uh, the Faith Coordinating Center at Wake Forest University School of Divinity was created in January 2021 to help build the capacity of faith leaders to address HIV and AIDS in the South and to particularly engage vulnerable communities, including African American and LGBTQI plus siblings. Today, uh, as is the case with so many diseases, Black Americans still account for higher proportions of new HIV diagnosis and people living with HIV compared to others. In 2018, Black Americans made up 42% of new HIV cases in the United States, with half of those living in the Southern states. 
These statistics have to change. And at the Faith Coordinating Center, we believe that faith communities are key to leading that change. We certainly have the, the, the uh, capability and, and possibility to do that. We are learning that one important barrier to making progress in addressing HIV and AIDS has to do with sexuality. And uh, more specifically, sexuality and the church. This is why we have gathered uh, this esteemed panel to address this barrier head on. So let's start, uh, panelists, by you sharing uh, with us um, how and where you enter this, this conversation around faith and sexuality. I'll start with you, Dr. Lightsey. Thank you, Dr. Jones. It's very good to be with you and to be with my other colleagues on this, I mean, just very important panel. You've already told uh, our guests about my role as an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church. And so it's, I'm, I'm from the very obvious, I have been an activist uh, against my denomination's very staunch and harmful um, polity against the LGBTQ community. Uh, as a pastor within the church, um, the, particularly the church on the south side of Chicago, where I pastored initially when I came to Chicago, I did a, lo I did a lot of education of our members about HIV AIDS and how it uh, affected black uh, people, not heterosexual and LGBTQ. And uh, that was very fruitful ministry and one that I still remember with quite a bit of pride to this day. On the other hand, uh, my not so obvious uh, ex experience of losing my oldest brother to complications related to HIV AIDS. And so, uh, this is both um, uh, something that I've been working with vocationally and personally. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, Bishop Allen, why don't you share with us uh, how and where you enter this, this, this conversation? Well, first of all, thank you all for the opportunity to be uh, with this amazing panel. I um, am just the preacher in the room. And I feel uh, absolutely overwhelmed and blessed to be around such brilliant people that I have learned from over the years. I will say that I entered this work really personally and pastorally. Uh, I grew up as a Pentecostal classic. I am a classical Pentecostal, <laughs> whatever that means. Uh, and I say that in many ways, in a great way also with all the tensions that come with it. Uh, but uh, you know, I grew up in what was quote unquote called holiness, uh, the holiness tradition. But over time, I, I, even as a young person, I saw how the term holiness was weaponized against uh, quote unquote sexual minorities and just sexuality in general. Uh, I, I, I was very present with that as a same gender loving man and, and really trying to figure my own self out. Uh, I, I thank God and the universe for, for placing great professors and people uh, that have been a part of my journey that helped to unfold really uh, theologically and personally how I could better understand myself. Professors at Morehouse, professors at Morgan, professors even at uh, Harvard uh, Extension School that really helped to um, broaden my way of looking at scripture and looking at my own self. Pastorally, I think I really wrestled as I had and have had to do so many eulogies and perform so many funerals and talk to so many families about particularly young black gay men uh, and Black trans women in my congregation that really created a tension with me and frustration. I, I very uh, proudly call myself an angry Black man at the church. And I'll talk about that a little later at just really what at the core from my perspective uh, was the church's role 
at creating this environment of self-hate. And that started me on a journey to really figure out the answers. Wow, wow, so powerful. Um, Dr. Brown Douglas, uh, where, where do you enter this conversation? That we, you know, many of us know that you wrote a seminal text on uh, sexuality in the black church uh, and have continued to have scholarship in that area. And you're also an ordained Episcopal priest. What, what, how do you enter into this conversation? Yes, first of all, thank you. Uh, Dr. Jones for inviting me into this conversation. And uh, it is indeed uh, a privilege uh, to be a part of this conversation with each of these panelists who uh, are so uh, significant uh, from their own spaces and really moving this, this narrative forward. And this is an important conversation and I thank you uh, for uh, having it. So uh, you mentioned uh, the book Sexuality and, and the Black Church. And so in many respects, uh, that book was the beginning of my sort of formal theological sort of entry way into this conversation, not the beginning, which I'll say more about, I guess, later of my concern uh, for these issues certainly uh, signaled that it uh, at the center and priority of my theological thinking. And, and as I state in that book, that because this was, it was, as uh, the two uh, speakers before me have said, it was a personal issue for me. And in fact, I think that theology uh, emerges when you, there are these crises and conflicts of which you're trying, seeking to understand your faith. You know, I rely on the old Anglican answer, uh, theology is faith-seeking understanding. Don't anyone tell anybody I'm quoting Anselm, but uh, faith-seeking understanding. And so that, that it is typically uh, in these times when wrestling with faith and trying to understand it, that these uh, issues emerge for me. And certainly uh, it is uh, what put me on this pathway of making this discussion of sexuality a priority because as I share in the book, I had uh, a cousin who's actually my, such a dear, 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 dear friend that we call each other cousins. Uh, his name was Lloyd. Uh, and grew up with Lloyd in Dayton, Ohio, and just is simply one of the best human beings that uh, I have been blessed to know on my life's journey. And I had named so much so that I named Lloyd as one of uh, my son's godparents. Uh, so Lloyd uh, was a gay black man and Lloyd loved the church. Uh, but the church didn't love him back. And uh, I, you know, just could not reconcile a church not loving someone who was so good simply because he happened to be gay. Those two things didn't make sense. And so uh, for me, if Christianity was a tradition that could not embrace and hold one of God's loving creatures, then I was ready to give up Christianity because I wasn't gonna give up Lloyd or anybody else for that matter. And so I was at this point of existential crisis trying to figure it out and it and it and it of course came to a head uh, as well for me because Lloyd would eventually succumb to complications from HIV AIDS and 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 the church still couldn't hold him and it was so toxic that even his own immediate family couldn't hold him right uh, uh, and this wasn't I said uh-uh this isn't the faith <laughs> that I want to be a part of. And it wasn't a church that I wanted to be a part of. So it was a part of the, the black church, right? And, and I said, no, yeah, I couldn't understand that. 
how the church could call itself black and be for freedom and be for justice and not affirm the sacredness and the value of a Lloyd. So it was a, a time of existential crisis, a time of a faith crisis. And uh, I went to seek the answers to discover whether or not Christianity was a faith that I could uh, be a part of, as well as whether or not the black church was an institution that I could be a part of. And so that's what pulled me into this conversation in a more theological way. Wow. Wow. You know, as I reflect on your, your comments, it strikes me that all of us, I imagine, have made a decision to hang in there with the church. And for many of us, the black church, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna dig a little deeper there uh, in just a bit. But uh, Quincy Reinhardt, Reverend Re Reinhardt, why don't, why don't you jump in here and tell us uh, where you're entering this conversation? Thank you so very much, Dr. Jones, and certainly to my colleagues, it's good to be here with you. I entered this conversation as a 38 year old black, gay, educated, queer man who um, grew up in the church, who loved the church. But as Dr. Brown definitely said, the church didn't always love me. Uh, I also entered this conversation uh, as an associate campus minister at uh, Morehouse College and having conversation and meetings with students who come to my office and they say, Reverend Reinhardt, I was just recently diagnosed with HIV and I don't know how to deal with this. Um, my father told me that, you know, I can't come home you know, that he would rather have a dead son than a HIV or gay son. And so dealing with that and thinking about what does all of this mean? What, what does this mean, you know? Um, and, and trying to provide hope to, to the students uh, who are 18, 19, 20 years old has been quite a challenge. Um, and yes, that's, that's where I, I entered this conversation. Um, hopeful that um, those of us doing the work can, can create some type of change. Yeah, so important, so important. And the population of young people that you're working with, so, so critical uh, for them to be a part of the conversation uh, as well. Um, Reverend Washington Leapart, um, so good to see you share with us how you're entering and, and where you enter this conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. And, you know, I'm just glad to keep this kind of company on a random Tuesday afternoon. Uh, <laughs> so I'm glad to be here. Thank you all. Um, I enter this conversation as um, a Black queer church girl um, who, um, it took seminary for me to come out with. And uh, I've I only recently connected the dots between this intensive search for meaning and faith and the intensive um, process of, of getting to know myself better. And um, so, it feels to me like the more faithful I become, the more queer I become. In that um, faith calls me to be honest first with my own self. So um, those two processes to me have been one. Um, I come to this conversation as a teacher, um, as one who wants to interrupt the kind of pedagogical practices and patterns that um, ultimately do so much tangible damage, right? That the, the consequences we see start with ideas and start with vision expressed in classrooms. And so I'm 
trying to interrupt that um, in the classroom. Um, and I know that I am a text that my students are reading, right? Um, and so for many of my students, I'm the first Black professor they've had, I'm the first queer professor they've had. And, you know, in their writing, they feel a liberty to breathe, I think, in ways that they may not in other um, academic spaces. And I'm just honored to hold the space for their breathing. And, and then I enter this conversation um, as an organizer, as one who, uh, and an advocate, as one who, um, you know, I guess I just refuse to surrender um, political rhetorics around faith to folks who mean me harm. And so um, I'm, I'm trying to add my voice to the chorus of folks who don't have a problem with you know, standing on the steps of the Supreme Court or, you know, sleeping at the, at the governor's door so that we get what we need uh, in our communities. And, and then lastly, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm a church girl who is, who is trying to navigate the sense of betrayal I feel by that church. And so I'll say more about that later, but uh, I too have a fraught relationship um, I love it as much as it also frustrates me. Um, and I'm estranged from the Black church as a result of that. So happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I think I'm going to steal that line. The, the more faithful I become, the more queer I become. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's true for a lot of us. That, that, that's true for so many of us. Um, let me say to our audience that um, throughout this uh, virtual training, we, are, we welcome your questions. Um, we, are, we will be taking questions from the live feed as well as the webinar. So uh, feel free to use the Q&A um, option to ask questions that you might have of the panelists. And toward the end of our time, we will make sure that we get to many of those. So let me ask you, uh, panelists, about your earliest memories of sexuality, your earliest memories of sexuality, and what, if anything, did the church have to do with it? Good, bad, or indifferent, your earliest memories of uh, Bishop, why don't I start with you? Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> uh, that is a very difficult question to answer in a way, just because I feel like I've always been aware of sex and sexuality on some level uh, in my entire existence. I think theological awareness or understanding how God or the church or the Bible impacted that uh, is something I know from my earliest memory. But I would say everything I learned about sexuality, about my body, about everyone else's body, about what was appropriate or not appropriate, quote unquote, I learned from the church. And I thought what was fascinating while I learned these ideas, no one at now, you know, we having a conversation? Can I, are we having a conversation? Uh, there was no conversation really about genitalia, especially about Jesus's genitalia or body, though we break his body every first Sunday. I, the, the whole body of Jesus in my tradition, the whole body, you know, there, there's a whole theology around the body of Jesus or the body of Christ, but you know, there was a lot missing <laughs> and no one ever explained it. Nobody really gave me anything to work with. And so it, I was on my journey myself, these panelists, oh my God, I, I, I wanna, I, I just thank you all. I want to say in particular, uh, Dr. Uh, Naomi 
um, made a statement that I thought was really great in terms of the tension and feeling almost assaulted by the black church. I am a pastor and I feel that way very strongly. It's something I wrestle with every week, every Saturday night, because I'm preaching from a text. And I will say this, my early frustrations with the church, I still have a lot of them. I still wrestle with it. I even wrestle with gospel music, but that's a whole nother panel and conversation for another day. But I finally realized that while I was angry with the black church, I realized that the homophobia in the black church that I was experiencing was created by white supremacy. Really the whole thing. As a matter of fact, the whole construct of the Christianity I practice was given to me by slave masters, by the people that I have their name. That is, that, is, that has really, I will tell you, the, the fact that I'm able, even able to say this uh, just amongst us, right, right? <laughs> I have an appreciation for that because it is the tension I live with and it's the tension I have lived with for so long. Uh, and what the, the last thing I will say about it, because we're talking about earliest memories, it's something I wrestled with. I just didn't have the language for it. I didn't know how to name it. And what I have found myself in a position of is also realizing that everyone else, in, for, for the most part in my room, is wrestling with the same thing, is trying to figure out how to name it. That's why this conversation is so critical. That's good, Bishop. That's, that's good. Now, you know, I'm tempted to ask you what, what it is that you learned about your sexuality around them church walls. Like, what, <laughs> yeah. well, I, I mean, I, I learned that there was something wrong with me. I learned mm -hmm. that God had a problem with me. I mm -hmm. learned that God was, was mad at me. I learned that God was so, that this, this interesting God, this, first of all, this God who was a man, <laughs> mm -hmm. he's called he, which is a whole problem, is, wants to put me in fire over something I didn't even, I, I mean, it, it, it when you talk about it, it, it is um, it is absolutely astounding around this idea of this deity that is angry, that is mad, that is uh, uh, on a on a on a vengeful journey to get rid of the things that this deity has created. And and I found that out, you know, and so I did wrestle with self-hate and not honoring and loving my own sexuality. And so I struggled with that. Mm -hmm. But I, I will say again, I appreciate, uh, and I understand your question, you know, I, my church <laughs> people might be on here. My I, people, I hear you, I hear you. I, you That's know, for another got to time. Keep it cute. Got to keep it cute. <laughs> but, but I appreciate the question because I think what I have learned in this process of God or this deity that I was given as opposed to the deity I have discovered, that this deity that I was raised with uh, was not the right one. <laughs> that that was not the right one. And that the deity that I have discovered created my sexuality for me to experience as a gift, as a gift. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good. So you know, what I'm hearing is that there is this learning that has taken place in our earliest times, right? And that at some point, we begin a process of unlearning these things, right? Uh, Dr. Lightsey, jump jump in here uh, with us. Uh, what, what are some of your earliest memories? Well, let me be me and let me problematize the question to begin with, okay? Because I, 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 in these conversations about sexuality, very often I find that we are not talking about the same thing. So what do we mean when we say sexuality? And for me, 
I try to position it in my mind, and, and I'll ask you to excuse the bad grammar. Are, are these folks talking about who you be, or are they talking about how you be you, or are they talking about both? Because if they're talking about who you be, the question of sexuality is, is, is really held as an ontological question, okay? If they're talking about how you be you, then the question becomes an anthropological or even sociological question. And perhaps it's even both of those. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to stick pins in where I need to stick pins in, in order to, um, to satisfactorily, to, to sufficiently answer the question. So my earliest memories of myself are based upon assumptions uh, that my community placed on me about who I be, who you be, okay? And that's the ontological question. I, I'm a girl, you know, I'm born a baby girl, a black woman, um, a black female child. That's the, the, the who I be, that's the assumptions. And I recognize that fair, fairly early on, you know, because we had a, really big family. We only had two boys in my family and the rest of my mother's seven children were girls. So I operated under the assumption that because my genitalia, okay, was the same as my sisters and because my mother and father spoke to me and would say, and my, my, my father was from Georgia, so he was Southern me. He said, come here girl. You know, I assumed that who I be was girl. Then I, you know, I moved on, and the question um, becomes how I be who I am, and children in school really influence that because they looked at my behavior. See, this becomes a question of behavior. It becomes a question of what you do or what you ought to do and what you ought not to do. That's a morality question right there, um, and 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 that that question. Um, is impacted whether or not you go to church. My family was not a church going family. So your question about the influence of the church on my understanding of my sexuality was not immediately in the immediate sense because of the church, because we rarely went to church. But in our black community, the influence of the church was so significant that whether or not you went to the church on Sunday, you were, you were still very influenced by the teachings of the church. People would come home and talk about what the preacher had to say. You could hear it on the radio. You, in my house, you couldn't listen to anything but gospel music on Sunday before one o'clock. And that was after church was out. So the influence of the church was really, really strong. And so I understood myself uh, to be a girl. I later understood myself because of the children in school who were quite the bullies, I understood myself and by my family to be a tomboy. I, I, you know, I, I, I understood myself in terms of things that I liked. I didn't like dolls. Um, I, I preferred dresses and pants. You, you could give me either one. So this is, you know, this is kind of shaping who I am as a human being. And because my family uh, in the community that we were in, this is in the 60s and 70s, the elders of the community took, you know, quite the liberties in raising you, even as your parents raised you. So it was nothing for the elders to come up to me and say, now you a nice little Christian girl. God don't want you around all those boys, you know, and to really try to shape me sexually in my behavior, who I associated with, the things that I did, the things that I liked, all of those things happen in a broader community than just, you know, my parents and the church. And, and, and so those memories are very strong for me. Even to this day, I believe that the community has beyond the church. I believe that the institutional church is much bigger uh, than one local church. And it has a lot of influence on black lives all around the country. So, you know, I, 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 I don't want to take up, you know, I, I know I have other colleagues who want to say more, but I wanted to establish that uh, for us so we can 
we can think and you know try to think um, in ways to help this push this conversation along. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and I think you're exactly right. There are there are uh, some of our LGBTQ plus siblings who've never done the door of a church, right? But have been influenced. Already know that to some extent welcome is not extended right, uh, because of the kind of influence that you're, you're talking about and the kind of socialization that happens in Black communities. Uh, Kelly Brown Douglas, why don't, you seem like you want to jump in, jump. Yeah, I mean, these two people, oh my goodness, so much <laughs> that I want to say. And even though I'm a, uh, an Episcopalian and born and raised Episcopalian, I've got to tell you, uh, Bishop Allen, you had me saying amen. Uh, to, <laughs> uh, and and to, to both of you and, uh, and want to affirm so much of what each of you have just said. So let me just pick up a little bit and, and, and try to uh, answer uh, your question as well, uh, Dr. Jones. And I, let me pick up with uh, where Dr. Lightsey left off in terms of sexuality and our understanding of sexuality and then try to answer your question and say a couple more things very quickly. That, uh, you, you know, we often equate sexuality with sex, right? Uh, and it, it's, it's going to become one of the problems in sort of this uh, Black church narrative. Uh, so we essentialize it to mean that. But while sexuality is not the whole of who we are, it involves all of who we are. And it's that thing that I think compels us into relationship uh, to, uh, as embodied beings. Right, and what all of that means is these embodied beings. And I'm gonna use this word right now, but then I'm gonna uh, say something more about the problematic of the word, but as embodied gendered beings. And, and, uh, and so it, in, it involves how we relate to ourselves, to others and to our God as these embodied gendered beings. And so to me, sexuality is what compels us into relationship, right? And, and, and so it's broader than um, uh, the essentialization of it as, as, as sex or et cetera. So when you ask me uh, sort of my first encounters or understandings of sexuality, well, of course I never understood it that way when I'm growing up. Uh, duh, and so, you know, that, that, that would come when you start thinking theologically and like, oh, okay. But what I understood growing up were a lot of these disconnects between the way in which I saw myself as an embodied being uh, and the way I related to myself and the world uh, and the way in which people had were relating to me and the ways in which they, the categories, right, into which they were trying to place me, right? And, and this tension like, well, you know, uh, uh, these, these binary gendered kind of constructions. And I'll say something real quick about that in a minute. And so, so that, you know, I'm this embodied female being, but social constructions of gender say that I ought to like dolls. I ought to uh, uh, love running around in dresses. I ought to love this, that, and the other. It's like, I don't like dolls. I prefer jeans over dresses. Uh, uh, and then I wanted to do things that in a that Boy, boy, those gendered boys wanted to do, and I kept. They kept saying, "You can't do them because you go what?" Uh, uh, and so this, this, this tension, this, this disconnect of trying to live into the fullness of who I was, competing against the way in which society had constructed these binary gendered realities. That's the first sort of recognition that I recognized early on. That, whoa, and then the. Then the other reality of certain kids, you know, growing up in, uh, uh, in going through elementary school, certain kids were called funny, right? This this is the terminology of my, and people would ask me, "Are you funny or something?" And 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 feeling this this sense of 
wait a minute, why are you all talking about people like that and 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 so feeling this sort of uh, connect. So those are my first, the earliest sort of understandings. And we just like everyone is saying, we didn't talk about, Episcopalians don't talk about that kind of stuff. We didn't talk about these issues of sexuality on any level. You just saw, you saw it play itself out, right? So no one has to talk about it because we learn by taking in. And so you're taking in these things, right? Uh, to what you see going in church, who gets the preferential options uh, uh, in, in one's church environment. Girls can't be in my environment. You can't be all acolytes and this, that, and the other kind of thing. So, so those were so sort of the things that I took in. The other thing that I, I wanna say sort of in response, uh, so I'm just putting these pegs out there and we can discuss them later. In response to a couple of things that uh, uh, Bishop Allen uh, spoke to, here's what I think about church, that to call ourselves church is aspirational. And we need to catch up. In order to be church, we have to catch up with God. And we've got to catch up with God's creation. And what I have come to learn and know is that God's creation has never ever on any level and any aspect of God's creation has never been binary. And in, in as much <laughs> as we claim to be church, we cannot promote binary ideas of God's rich creation, period. And when we do that, it is a betrayal of what it means to be church. And it is, it is not living into uh, the God in whose image we are presumably created and that the church is supposed to be a glimpse of in the world. So to call ourselves church is aspirational and we need to be on the move toward catching up with God. Also, in as much as we, uh, a church is adopted, as you said, Dr. Allen, the slave master's version of Christianity, then one, that church ain't black and that church ain't Christian. And, and we know from the very beginning, and I won't say anymore, that the enslaved, they queered that religion that the slave masters gave them, right? To, to be real, to be Christian is to queer this thing out here that calls itself church so that it opens up its moral imaginary to embrace the, the richness of who God has called us to be. So I, I just want to stop there and just put those two little pins there that just because you call yourself church don't mean you church. And just because you call yourself black don't mean you black. And so, and so when you put those two things together, if you're really black and you're really church, then you can be Christian. Ooh, like the saints used to say, my God today. Where do we send the offering? I know, I know. <laughs> um, you know, we have, so uh, Naomi, Quincy, um, I wanna move us a little bit unless you have something uh, urgent you wanna say about your earliest memories uh, and, or maybe ask it along with this one, right? Why do Black people of faith struggle with so many issues related to sexuality? And I'm asking this in the context of understanding uh, for many of us, uh, in addition to the things that Bishop Allen shared in terms of what he learned through the church, um, I think many of us are taught this bifurcated uh, way of being, right? It's either the flesh or the spirit right? You don't want to succumb to your fleshly desires and, you know, those kinds of things. So just wondering from your perspective, you can reflect on your earliest memories as well, but why do you think so many people of faith, faith, Black people of faith, struggle with issues of sexuality? I'll jump in here. You know, there's, there's so much shame. We have been shamed. Um, and we've been, we've taken on, you know, a friend of mine likes to say, don't take on shame that ain't yours. We have taken on other people's shame. Um, and it connects to my earliest memories of sex and sexuality in church. Um, there was so much pretense to, to the point that Dr. Brown Douglas made. Nothing in my home church was, was explicit. 
But there was so much eroticism in church. Uh, I mean, you could, you could feel it in the air. Everything was erotic from the way the preacher, you know, we say mounted the pulpit. Uh, and the way, you know, so-and-so's clothes kind of fell when they were shouting or, the, you know. So sex, sexuality, notions of intimacy and love were all around me, but nobody ever called it that. Um, and that silencing, I think is connected to the way we've been told that to be fully a sexual being is to be a shameful being. Um, you know, um, and, you know, I'm a survivor of clergy sexual abuse. So, you know, this question is a lot uh, for me. And I think for so many of us, you know, what was made explicit was made explicit within the context of an abusive, manipulative, exploitative relationship. I mean, I use the word relationship, but because my vocabulary, I don't, there's no word. But with, within the context of this, um, this period of my life, um, so everything goes as long as nobody knows was like the, the mantra, right? There was lots of sex going on. There was lots related to sexuality, lots related to non-heterosexuality, like just different, you know, but it was all implicit. It was all um, behind the, the sh in the shadows. Um, so, so that's one thing I would say. And then, and then secondly, you know, I think church also taught me not only the mechanics of sex, the kinds of sex, the kinds of way, you know, but also how and what I should desire. The church told me, the church ordered my desires. Taught me what to long for, what to yearn for. Um, and so, you know, when I said earlier that I'm navigating a relationship that to me is characterized by betrayal, that's what I mean. It's like, how do I return or remain present in and serve with my gifts? Um, an institution that has so deeply betrayed my trust. Uh, and, and so, you know, how can I pastor well when I was not pastored well, right? How can I be the kind of minister that I needed? Somebody to be like, mm -mm, something, somebody to make explicit what was forced into the proverbial closet, right? Um, so I think that, that there was just a lot of pretense because we didn't want to be ashamed. Um, we had been told certain things about our bodies, about how to be respectable, how to be legible, how to be holy. And so, so that there's the, the political infringement on our spiritual formation, right? We are trying to be acceptable in a broader society that has already told us that our bodies are deficient and malformed. Um, and, and, and so I have a very painful first memory of, of sex and sexuality in, in church. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of us, I'm sure a lot of us do. Um, yeah. Shonda, can, can I make a distinction here for us? Sure. That is Im important. I, I want to make a distinction between the institutional church, okay? The church as, as a, um, the, as a spiritual, the spiritual church, that is for Christians, the body of Christ. And then the church as a, a gathering of believers. Those are three different distinctions. And the reason I wanna make this distinction is because 
the question begs us to think about the church as a body or a gathering of believers, okay? I think as a, as a body of believers, a gathering of believers, we assign, we have assigned too much uh, innocence and naivete to that body of believers. As if to, and, and to say that the church struggles with issues of sexuality is something that I'm not, I am not at this point in my life willing to accept. Other than I accept, then I accept that the church, this gathering of believers are so naive, so ill-equipped to talk about human sexuality in this 21st century as to be nonsensical, okay? So the, the church, particularly the black church, as a gathering of believers, uh, I would say does not struggle with human sexuality, does not struggle with sexuality in the sense that we often want to ascribe to it. And Reverend Leapheart uh, Washington has, has just made that, that case for us. There are more hookups that happen on Sunday morning and in church conferences than I would, and this is pre-pandemic, maybe even more so because of Zoom, there are more hookups that take place than take place on maybe even Grindr or any of these other social apps. You know, these things are happening and people don't struggle. They know what they're doing and they've been taught and they keep doing it and repeating it and doing it well. As a microcosm of the larger society, there's a lot of conversation, as, as um, my colleague, Reverend Naomi, has said, that goes on about sexuality. So if, in fact, we are willing to, to say that, that the Black church or Black churches okay, struggle with sexuality, then we have to ask ourselves, why do we think they, what, what is the struggle all about? In what way is this, does the struggle take shape? I think really what we're getting at is the discriminatory practices of the church and how some members within the church may, may disagree even may disagree even with their own pastor and rightfully so. And they, they may struggle with how to tell their pastor, no, nah, Reverend, stop it. Now that's where the struggle may be. And getting people to have the courage to take a stand against discrimination is the struggle. Thank, thank you, Dr. Lisey, for that clarification. And thank you, uh, Naomi, for your, your sharing. You know, there seems to be trauma upon trauma upon trauma that, happen in, that happens in these faith spaces. And as Dr. Lisey points out, in these gatherings of believers, right? Um, and thank you for sort of pointing us in a direction about where the struggle lies, right? Um, it seems to me, right, that some of what uh, is happening related to the discriminatory, the discriminatory practices has to do with the kind of biblical interpretation, the kinds of theologies that people that are embedded in, in faith communities and practiced in faith communities. Um, talk to us about, so we, let me just share with our, our, our listeners that so we've been on this journey together in this short amount of time talking about uh, what we've learned early on and moving toward this unlearning. So I'm gonna invite our panelists to, to help us, uh, help us move toward you know, the tools that we need to unlearn some of these unhealthy. Uh, and and uh, how, do we, how do we begin to, to, to challenge and tackle these discriminatory practices that happen as we gather as people of faith. Who wants to start that? I'll jump in, but I'm also aware, and I don't know if he's uh, 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 still with us. Uh, would love to hear from uh, 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 Reverend Reinhardt's uh, voice if he's still there. So I don't wanna- He's gonna, he's gonna come back to us. Um, he's not feeling quite well, oh, but he's gonna okay. note that said he's off and he'll come back. Oh, I'm, and see, I'm so old. I can't multitask when I'm on Zoom. So you all probably saw that in the chat, and I didn't see that. So, so, so thank you. Uh, 
but <laughs> Leipzig. Let, and, and, and I'll be brief in trying to answer, begin, not answer, uh, to uh, begin uh, to uh, my thinking, share my thinking on that question. First, you know, I think several things have come together uh, in uh, the black church. And keep in mind when I say black church, we're talking about not one institution that's, as we all know, we're talking about uh, really black churches. Uh, and it's the uh, history of who we are that brings us together, but the black church is diverse. Uh, but I think three, three things have sort of come together and interacted to make even the discussion of sexuality, a taboo issue, and, and uh, uh, so that we can begin to have healthy uh, discussions and healthy views about sexuality, about our bodies, about ourselves, et cetera. Uh, I think one, and uh, 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 Reverend Leapart gets at this, it has to do with the way in which our own historically due to uh, realities of white supremacy, et cetera, the way in which our own sexuality, our own bodies have uh, indeed been put upon. And the fact that we have been uh, a part of our oppression uh, as black people have been that we've been a sexualized people and what that has meant. And so our responses to uh, the hypersexualized trope of who we are that has not been a benign trope, right? Uh, we have paid the, continue to pay the price for that trope. But a part of our response to that hypersexualization uh, has been one of the things that has drawn us toward this sort of uh, toxic normative sort of narrative of, of, of sexuality, if you will. The other thing that has come together with that, and uh, Bishop Allen, you talk about being a classical Pentecostal and uh, at one point in that tension is a evangel Protestant Puritan evangelical narrative of uh, sexuality that does this body soul split, this bad body, good soul, bad flesh, good soul split. And we've got to remember that a significant number of black persons became Christian during that, uh, those evangelical revivals, right, in the 18th century. So that narrative has become a part of the Black faith tradition. Put that together with this, this our reaction to this hypersexualized trope, well, you got a problem. Because we are consistently trying to live over and against that trope, and in living over and against that trope means that we're trying to live over and against the flesh, the body, and the way that has been defined find in this uh, Protestant Puritan evangelical narrative. You all still with me? So I'm just trying to say this. Then you asked uh, uh, Dr. Jones about the, the Bible, right? So then we have, and here's what we have to understand. And, and one of the things I'm growing more and more to understand, I don't care what you do, you know, we go to seminary and all that, everybody, on, and we learn exegesis and say, and we can say to people, this is not in the Bible. You know, there ain't nothing in the Bible. Show me in the Bible that condemns uh, uh, people who don't happen to be, uh, uh, heterosexual or whatever. It, it, it in the Bible or you misunderstanding this, but it's not, you can talk that until the end of day in the pulpit and nobody gonna be moved because what we have to understand is that, that what has become authoritative is a history of interpretation that has gained authority. And so you can talk all that mess that you want to talk. And so also, but my, that ain't what my grandmother told me. So that we have to break into a history of interpretation that has become authoritative in, the, uh, 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 in our tradition, in our Black church tradition. And here's the thing. We only cling, hold on to those things which work. If it don't work, we let it go. And so we've got to figure out what is it that works. And there are things, I mean, James Baldwin talks about this in his, in his uh, uh, book, Go Tell It, right? There are things that work. And James Baldwin talks about it in essays, you know, to, 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 to say that we have to stay away from sins of the body. I mean, that kept some people alive. 
right? And so what are the things that have worked and we need to dismantle that and put something else in place? So I think these three things have come together that have created the situation where sexuality becomes a taboo issue. And uh, that has created, I love it, you talk about this sense of shame. We've taken on a shame that is really created by the sin, yes, of, of white supremacy that has created this breach between us and the God who created us, created this, which means a breach with our own, our own divine embodied selves and, and, and this reality of who we've been created to be in the world that we're to be. And so it's the three things, the hypersexualized trope, uh, the uh, uh, evangelical Protestant Puritan narrative that has become a prevailing narrative in our black church traditions, faith, and uh, that this, this authority of interpretation that has been handed down, that has gained more authority than what is in the biblical witness itself. Wow, 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 wow. Uh, Naomi, I see your hand up. It seems like you wanna jump in there. Well, I just, you know, similarly, I think, you know, we, we have a lack of, I don't know, imagination about how and where God speaks, right? The Bible becomes the sole singular source of God's revelation, right? Uh, but, you know, black folks, we've always, you know, it was in the song, it was in the, it was in the chord, it was in the, uh, uh, the, the way that tree, the light shines between, the we've always found God off the page, I tell my students, off the page, right? Um, the, the, our lives become the pages where we read about God. And so this, you know, what Peter Gomes called bibliolatry, right? This worship of the symbol of the thing as the thing itself um, has really done us harm. You know, Dr. Will Gaffney says, um, everything right ain't biblical and everything biblical ain't right, right? That, that everything that is right and just and pure and holy ain't in the Bible. There's some truths with the big T that we know and we didn't find it in the Bible, right? And everything in the Bible ain't right, right? The, 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 sometimes the book is the, is the problem. Right, but but I can't go in nobody's pulpit and and you know take my text of you know Octavia Butler or of right uh, when Octavia Butler <laughs> is and was and will continue to be a prophet uh, by whom God is speaking, right? And so I think this worship of the biblical text as the only way that God can reveal God's self to us is one of those things that has to be dismantled. And we have to be courageous enough to say everything biblical ain't right. Right, I'm not, I'm not coming to any other, con any more conversations about what the Bible does and does not say about how people do what they do when they do what they do. I'm not coming to any more of those conversations um, because it is true that everything biblical ain't right. And I know that's, that's, you know, y'all want to, nobody has to invite me. I, I'm okay. uh, so, so yeah, that's, I think that's one of the things we got to deconstruct and dismantle. Yeah. So everything biblical ain't right. And this sort of inherit that we've inherited this authoritative um, history of interpretation, right? That lives deep and wide in black communities. Uh, Bishop, I'm curious to know, I mean, you're pastoring a bunch of people, some gay, some straight, um, what, what are the, what, how do you, how do you tackle head on this sort of, this history of this kind of interpretation that has done so, such tremendous harm? I mean, interpretations that are literally killing us, right? Yes. What, 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 what do you do? Yes. I, you know, I have been listening and I feel like I am, we're talking about church. I have been in church. This is church. This is absolutely fantastic. I was writing a few things down and it has been said uh, from my own personal pastoral experience. You know, I, I started a few years ago and it was very tough 
to say to my congregation a few years ago, and I've been pastoring vision for 16 years, and I, it took me 13 of those years to finally say what I really thought. And can I be honest? That's the truth. That's the truth. And I finally said to the room, you know, it's shaking almost, nervous and afraid, that, you know, I can't use my oppressor's theology to free myself. I, that's where I started. I'm telling you where I started. I cannot use my oppressor's theology to start my journey of freedom. I can't do it. And I was, I told the room, this is me. You, you can do what you want with this. And I literally wept after I said it, because I preached a series on what Jesus wouldn't do. <laughs> you know, what Jesus would do. I said, what Jesus wouldn't do. And I challenged religion. I challenged the whole thing. And I just expected that I, the board was going to need a resignation letter. Come to find out. Dr. Naomi, everybody in the room, because I pastor a lot of millennials, everybody in the room was just, you know what they said to me, and I get emotional when I think about it. People were like, well, damn, we were waiting for you to say that. Well, damn, why, we, we, we've been waiting 10 years for you to say this. And I, then I got mad at myself. And then what I realized is there were people in the room that were trying to reimagine theology. Because the issue, as, as uh, Dr. Kel Dr. Kelly said, Reverend Dr. Kelly said, the, the, the issue is biblical authority. And the truth is, because we're talking about a generation now that understands some things that we've been trying to get people to understand, they're already there. They understand that transphobia ignores the fluidity of God. They know that something ain't right to have a male deity create Eve, if that even actually happened. Like they, they already wrestle with the ideas. And that really, I believe, we just need courageous clergy that would say, you, somebody just said it, you are the sacred text. See, the problem is the canon is not closed. I love what the UCC church says. God has been, God is always talking. Like God ain't stopped, you know, and, and the canon is the problem. And so I think as I begin to talk about that in, in our room, then it's easier to preach a sermon uh, from the sacred text of James Baldwin, <laughs> you know, as the sacred text. And also not, this is the other thing, you know, while I have millennials, I have, I said yesterday, I have two roles. I have a mother's board. <laughs> I have a traditional mother's board that, you know, they, they, they are wrestling too. And that I am not here to say that you have to throw away the Christian text. I am simply saying we can expand it. And I found out that there are more people that are willing to understand an expanded view of sacred text than I thought. We can reimagine faith. We can reimagine theology. We can reimagine, catch this, you know, uh, I, I had a conversation with Bishop Flunder a couple of years ago about this. You know, when, when will the theologians and the preachers and the progressive faith leaders get together and decide what the next testament will be. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it there. I won't go any further. Thank you for that, Bishop. You know, I'm wondering, um, Dr. Lightsey and I are part of the same tradition in the United Methodist Church. Um, and I alluded to this earlier, right? That um, in spite all of the harm that uh, churches and the church has done to so many people that we've opted to stay, whether strange or not, right? We're tethered in some way, right? 
Um, Dr. Lights, I'm wondering, as you sort of journey about sort of dismantling this sort of history of interpretation that's been so damning, or theologies that have been so toxic, what, what advice uh, would you have for our audience who find themselves in similar situations where they're in uh, faith spaces that uh, create harm instead of justice, uh, particularly for, for LGBTQ persons in churches? I will just say that I think that uh, for persons in our who are listening that you really have to do an internal um, inventory to determine how much you can bear. And Jesus ain't telling you to bear everything. I don't care what they preach, you know, not even the cross. Jesus ain't telling you to bear that cross because Jesus bore it for you. Um, I think you have to recognize what your, what are those in, what's the line for you? And for me, it's been important because I've been so blessed. You know, my parents taught me that your blessings, when you're blessed, you're required to, you have, you owe someone, you know, you didn't get to where you were, are by yourself. So my parents taught me to pass on my 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 blessings in the ways that I can. I stay in the United Methodist Church, and I'm going to say this humbly. And Shonda, you 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 step in here. I'm one of the few out ordained African American queer lesbians with high credentials. I have a terminal degree, an earned PhD, in the United Methodist Church. Okay, that establishes me as one of a very few in my predominantly white denomination. And in my mind, I, in my mind, I feel I have responsibility to use all of that to protect, to help make a way for, to establish some pathways to, to not just striving, but thriving for Black LGBTQ people and Brown LGBTQ persons within the church and outside of the church. I have come to a point uh, where I've had a significant number of emails and other things really quietly sent to me with people who thanked me because they were on the verge of committing suicide. You get one of those, you know, you, you recognize, okay, I don't care what the conservative right wing writes about you, says about you, tries to come at you to take your credentials from you, that God has ordered your path in such a way that at least one life was saved. So I, I hang on in the United Methodist Church to be, you know, I, I, I you know, they come at me nine ways to Sunday, but I'm, I, you know, I don't, I mean, okay, do what you, do what you think you can do, because I, there's, there, there's plenty, I've recognized that, that no matter how many bullies, how many fundamentalists, how many evil persons are within the church, God has more people that will come to support me than those who attack me. And by my standing, and this is what I want people to recognize, by your standing, if you, to the extent that you can, you're, you, are, you are making a way for someone else, okay? I don't use, I don't get into scripture battles with people anymore. I don't do, I, I'm actually bored by them. These kind of apologetics that I see going back and forth. Well, why don't you talk to us about scripture? That's kind of, that's kind of boring to me because, you know, I, I came up in the Pentecostal tradition. Honey, I can quote chapters of the King James Version. That in and of itself, because I can quote it, because I can exegete it, has not been as powerful as me building relationships with people. And so it is not as much a theological a theological task as it is a sociological task. And that is where I found my strength. And that's where I, I've been, I, I think that I have been successful. I love, I, really, I'm, I'm being honest with you. I 
I try as best I can to be a loving human being and not to think too highly of myself as, as I should. And, and then finally, I wanna say something because I think this is important, Sean, if you'll just allow me. There has been a lot of hostility directed against the LGBTQ community by the teachings of the church. People like myself need to stay as much as we can uh, and be a thorn in the flesh to these bigots in the church and use all of our clout, all of our influence, all of our power to withstand it. And that's what I, that's what I intend to do because that hostility, it initially was directed against the LGBTQ community. But look, I mean, there was, there was HIV AIDS stigma and it still remains against the LGBTQ community, even though the numbers would show you that at heterosexuals, you know, are 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 are, contact, con, are 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 being struck by HIV AIDS, and so we have to be opponents to this the this discrim, discrim, discrimination, and and that for me is really really important. I, I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. And I just real quickly uh, before you jump in, Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, I just want to, uh, as Pamela, you know, you you authored the book Our Lives Matter, a woman is queer theology. Uh, with what you've just shared with us, are, are, there, are there tools or things that come out of a womanist queer theology that you could lift up to us that would be useful uh, in us trying to dismantle some of these discriminatory practices in the church? Thank you. I'll take that shameless plug. You can find my book on Amazon or you can Google it and find it at Whip and Stock. Yes, thank you very much. And I'm trying to finish another book that will come out next year. I wrote the book because I recognized there was not a single manuscript that a black LGBTQ person could pick up or an ally that would have language, theological language in it, that would have, that would unpack language of, around sexuality, that is who we be and how we be, uh, that was on the shelf. And I wanted to do that. And I wanted to be able within that book to, to show people, to demonstrate to people that it is possible to be both an, uh, a black LGBTQ person and a Christian whom God adored. Uh, and so that's one book. Another, I mean, my colleague, Kelly Brown Douglas, I mean, I read her book before I, before I wrote my book and, and Sean Copeland's book also. Those are, I mean, just terrific scholars. Um, and their works need to be read. I would say that that's a trinity right there. Uh, that is, you know, I deal with philosophy and theology and it is deeply about uh, queer theology, deeply about the lives of uh, black, uh, lesbian, bisexual, transgender women. Uh, and it was unapologetic. It remains an unapologetic work. Oh, thank y'all for, for putting up the hyperlink. <laughs> buy me, buy me, buy me. That's what my book is saying. <laughs> I, I will count that as a seminal text as well. Uh, Kelly Brown Douglas, you were going to jump in, in here. Uh, we're, we're still talking about how do we dismantle some of these discriminatory practices and build up theologies of hope and liberation uh, and healing in such a way that, that we begin to, to save our own lives. Yeah, first of all, thank you, uh, 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 Dr. Pamela, uh, and for your work, and uh, as always, uh, uh, for your support, because we are not to, just because it's a cliche doesn't mean it's not true, because we are in this together. Uh, and I'll, I just want to say a couple things that, uh, again, <laughs> these panelists inspired uh, in my thinking. Every conversation, I mean, I hope to learn in this conversation, uh, my cup runneth over in learning and wisdom. And so thank you. Uh, one, to leave off, to pick up where uh, Dr. Lightsey left off, discrimination, and that's a mild word. Uh, I like to say LGBTQ terrorism, and any kind of uh, ideology, construct, system structure, theology that uh, denies, dehumanizes, 
uh, degrades the humanity of another is violent. It's sinful and uh, it has fatal consequences. Uh, and we need to recognize that and be clear about that. It destroys lives uh, in all ways. And when people are sitting in these institutions that call themselves churches and hear this kind of terrorizing theology, people are taking that in uh, uh, and as we have heard all of, of these stories and the fact that people can emerge from these institutions with any sense of wholeness and affirmation of the sacredness of their very humanity, that's a miracle when you are in even ecclesiastical contexts that foster and nurture your death, not your life. So I think we need to understand that and recognize that what we are doing in these churches is not benign. Uh, uh, the other thing that I like to say, look, you know, people said, forget we could quote scripture all day. I'm Episcopalian, so I couldn't quote scripture all day, but, uh, but, <laughs> uh, but here's what we know, and this is what I try, I try to live by and try to impart to others. Forget, okay, I ain't gonna quote scripture with you. Forget about that. But here's what I'm gonna say. That every major religion that we know, or even not religion, has some form of the golden rule, all right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But I like to talk about the reverse golden rule in this sense. Don't ever withhold from another that which you would not want withheld from yourself. Let's begin there, right? And that which you don't think God would withhold from you, don't withhold it from another, right? That includes, you want a decent place to live, don't withhold it from another. You want, you want, you want to, uh, enough food to eat, don't withhold it from another. You want to feel affirmed in who you are, don't withhold it from another, and then go about creating a world that doesn't withhold from another that which you would not with, withheld from yourself. Let's just start there. And then when we talk about being courageous, Bishop Allen, for those of us who would claim to be people of faith, we are to be accountable, not to the way things are, but to the way God has created the world to be. We are to be accountable not to any things about our unjust present, but we are to be accountable to God's just future. We need to live our lives accountable to that. It's a matter of accountability. And in God's more just future, right, everybody's breath is valued as sacred because everybody's breath is sacred because it came from God. And God's more just future is a future where everybody's sacred breath is treated as sacred. Everybody, without exception. And so if we are accountable to that, then it is our task to go about creating a world that repairs the breach, if you will, between our unjust present and God's just future and all that is required to repair that breach. And so that's that's where we, and, and that, that means, yes, calling out systems and structures. It means calling out these theo terroristic theologies, these, the, these institutions that call themselves religious and call themselves church that are terrorizing people. So all those things, I, we could go into all those things, but those, those, are, those are the three things, but you know, as I say to people, if you can't get nothing else, let's just start here. Don't withhold from another that which you want would not want withheld from yourself. And if you're religious, that which you think God would not withhold from you.
And let's, let's just start there. And everybody said, amen. <laughs> Uh, Naomi, I saw you had your hand up. Do you, did you want to follow up on that? It was so good. It was so good. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say quickly, you know, I'm going to be in lifelong recovery from the violence and trauma that I have experienced in Black church spaces. Lifelong recovery. I can't outsource that. I, I can't, my seminary degree ain't gonna make up for it. The progressive sermons I preach are not going to stitch together my heart. Uh, it, and so I think the black church has for too long outsourced repentance. You know, by having Naomi come preach, you have been absolved of your sins. I need to see the recovery work. I need to see, because you can't pour out of an empty vessel. You cannot demonstrate radical love for me and my queer body if you don't, if you don't have it to give me if you don't show yourself radical love. That's why I think that the, the introspection piece, and, and they're not the same thing, but so many of us who are also trying to do work within these ecclesial spaces around white supremacy and, and specifically race, say to the white churches, say to the white clergy, don't get don't, you're not going to be able to invite Black people to your church or whatever. If you have not done the work, don't invite me to your pulpit, talk, you know, pulpit swap or whatever. If you have not done the work, why would I come? If you don't recognize that we are, <laughs> you have been terrorizing us. And one sermon ain't going to do that. One powerfully worded statement about this or that, one marriage that you officiate at the altar is not going to, this has to be a lifelong work of repentance and recovery. And that's why I so appreciate when you say, you know, the, the, that one Bible study or reading that one book is not going to get us there. Because there's something deep down inside, you know, just like the tapes that are in my head. I can't educate my way out of the lies that play on repeat that I have been given uh, by the church, right? And so I just, um, I, I just want to say that that uh, there has to be, we have to have something. There, we are so bankrupt in vulnerability, the humility required to be like, we were wrong. We were wrong. And it, it has not been uh, benign, as Dr. Brown Douglas says, that we were wrong and people have died. So I, I just wanted to name that yeah. as, as part of the work. Yeah. Repentance and recovery, necessary. You know, I wanna shift, uh, we have another 30 minutes and we have several questions that are being asked by our audience. Um, so I'm gonna start with that, especially Naomi, since you left off with the recovery and repentance that's needed as a part of the work. Someone uh, uh, made a statement and then asked a question. So I'll, I'll read it as it, as it was given to me. Advocates against domestic, domestic violence make space for victims to gain enough strength to leave their abusers. It, is, it often takes time and resources. However, the advocate rarely suggests that the victim should return. What is your why? Why do you return and stay? Is it worth unearthing or does one start afresh? Further, are we really liberated 
if we reenact the same structures that harmed us? And they're not suggesting that any of you are doing that. But the question is, what is your why? Given in, in characterizing, we're talking about this terrorism, right? This death dealing actions that are happening uh, in, in, in the church. What is your why? This is to any panelists. I want to say that the United Methodist Church is a very large institution, the third largest Christian denomination in the nation, and holds one third of the political power in Congress uh, at one time, in, including all the way up to the highest office in the land, the presidency, and that was with Hillary Clinton as First Lady. Uh, with that kind of power, uh, I find it important for me to remain a voice uh, of reason, a voice of healing, a voice of protection, someone who will protect those who want to leave, will make safe passage for them uh, so that they are not utterly harmed as they leave. Uh, within my denomination. Uh, at the same time as how I stay, um, I, there, you know, I want to admit to you that I think, you know, there are some things about the Black church that are so endearing and so touching and so tender for me. I love to hear a good, um, you know, a good hymn. I love to hear when uh, the deacons of the church line out of him in that old Baptist fashion. Uh, it touches me, brings tears to my eyes as I listen to a choir sing so beautifully. There are times that I go to church um, and just being there in that space, the tenderness, the, in, the, the kind of um, a fellowship that's in that in that liturgy touches me so deeply in a way that I'm just, that's so unf I'm in unfamiliar territory in predominantly white spaces with predominantly white liturgy. So it's important for me to find those kinds of spaces that are affirming. And we do have black churches that have wonderful liturgy, wonderful preaching moments that are quite affirming in denominations across the country. It's not necessary for me to sit through a wonderful, wonderful liturgy and then be uh, offended by a sermon, I, you know, or even as people trying to raise money, you know, people find a way to come at you with their homophobia in the lyrics and music during the offering. I mean, they, they find all kinds of ways to sneak that stuff in there, but there are places and there are spaces to do the work, uh, and and I think that's important. I also think it's important, and I think this is this is happening because of the pandemic. People are taking a different look at their churches, particularly through Zoom. And some people are finding out, you know, pastor really can't preach. All all they've been doing is hollering, and the and the and the organ and the and the Leslie and the Hammond been covering up a whole bunch of crap. And I don't think I'm going back there because they couldn't preach in the first place. Now I'm just, now this is light see. So the pandemic is revealing some stuff too, okay? So I think that black church spaces are going to change tremendously when we really get back in full play. And people are gonna come back initially, but then they're gonna say, oh, I saw some stuff on Zoom that was much better than where I am. I think I'll take my little self over there. So I think there's gonna be a significant shift in black church spaces when we start going back. And people have been doing wonderful jobs in the virtual spaces, but I'm also wondering how, because some people need to see that concretely, how that might be translated. And if we will get some more uh, affirming and predominantly black LGBTQ spaces that do not try to repeat and reinvent white liturgy or black, um, uh, uh, black patriarchy, you know, uh, in our liturgy too, because there are some denominations that are very patriarchal and aren't helpful for us. And I'll, I'll stop there. You know, I think um, Kelly Brown Douglas, I think with this question about sort of why do we stay, right, uh, has to do with your notion about church being aspirational. Would you, would you say that's true? 
yeah, I thought you were going to pick on me because not only uh, why I stay and I'm in a denomination uh, that is uh, 99, 90, between 95, 97, 99 percent white uh, in a denomination uh, that is not uh, adjacent to uh, colonization and uh, uh, imperialism and all of that, but is, is it? Uh, it is empire in terms of his which so I thought you'd give my pick on me, uh, Dr. Jones. Uh, the, so, so thank you for being generous. But um, why do we stay? And you know, and and one can, I obviously have to answer that from uh, why do I stay? Uh, and first, let me say that that's a question that I think uh, we is not a you answered once and 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 that's it. Uh, you know, it's a question that we continue to have to continue to ask ourselves. And when when there becomes too great of a disjunction between uh, your core values and the institution that you're a part of, uh, then you have to make the decision that you know I can't stay at somewhere that's really compromising uh, my my. So my core values, right? So I so I think that that's not a once and for all question, uh, uh, and uh, for me, staying is as long as uh, there is uh, a place that I can see that uh, institution is least on the arc that bends toward just just get on the arc. Uh, uh, you don't have to be perfect because we aren't. You know, it's not that you aren't gonna make mistakes because you are, uh, to, but just get on the arc. Uh, uh, and, and, and if you do that, um, and if, if along the way, and I also think you're, you're right, uh, Dr. Leapart, that it's just as it's not a once and for all uh, question and answer that repentance, is not a once and for all thing. Uh, it, uh, it's a process, it's a movement. You know, it's about naming the sin and turning around and doing something different. Uh, uh, and so uh, let's stay in this, in, 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 in this process. So I think there are a lot of reasons uh, why, we, why, why we stay and then we choose where we're gonna be. And, uh, and you don't, you know, and you make choice that that's, what particular uh, place you're going to be in, what particular uh, community. The other thing that I would say is that I say to people all of the time that we are not called into spaces that try to kill us. And sometimes it takes more courage to leave than it does to stay. And because a part of even our victimization, if you will, is that, you know, we are led to believe what is said about us is true and that it's our fault. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that takes one, uh, those of us in the church to help people is uh, to understand mm -mm, this isn't this isn't of God. This is of the sinful humanity uh, in the toxic sinful culture that you're a part of. And so, you know, part of our job is to help people to leave when when they need to leave, because if it's not life giving loving and just, then that's just not of God. Uh, uh, and help people to, to recognize that. And so a part of my work in some instances uh, have been to help people, particularly uh, who uh, are LGBTQ, uh, to leave these toxic Christian spaces and, and to find uh, other spaces and to help them to recognize, no, if it hurts, that's just not of God. 
uh, uh, and and so yeah, so as long as there are people who are trying to push toward uh, the more just future that is God's, then 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 I'll hang in there with them. And, and and but when when the breach becomes too great and there's no one there trying to close that breach, then it may be time to leave. For for me. And I don't know if that answered your question, but as I say, that's all I got. <laughs> it's it's a struggle. No, thank you for that. I'm I'm uh, scrolling through some other questions. Um, you know, here's here's one. Um, how do we lift up and affirm younger generations of Black LGBTQ folks? who are coming up in the church or pursuing, pursuing careers in ministry? Anyone? This connects to how I would answer the question, why do you stay? I mean, I needed somebody when I was, you know, 13, who, could fully see me and what was going on, what was happening to me. I needed somebody with a queer eye. And I, I guess I'm staying because of the possibility that I could do something that signals to the little ones, even older ones who are looking for somebody with a queer eye. That just by making eye contact, just the head nod, just the communicates a kind of solidarity that, that they're not alone, they're not by themselves. You know, like maybe like for five minutes, I could be the pastor I needed. Uh, and, and I'm not afraid of the ambiguity and messiness and fraught nature of estranged relationship. I think estrangement is a kind of relationship where the boundaries are clear. Uh, I, I'm not sure I need well, I think that for some of us, the right fit, the right kind of relationship, the right intimacy level is estrangement. So like, I don't endeavor anymore to be, you know, you know, whatever lovey-dovey is with, with, with the black church. Like perhaps estrangement is my, is my lot, is our lot. Um, and from that distance, I can perhaps see with my queer eye things more clearly. But but I want to try to be, I don't want to desert the thing and leave the people who are trying to find somebody alone. And so I think that's what continues to compel me um, to stay. At, and you know, what I would say to younger, you know, is, I don't know, like, I, I, I just, that, that you, you are, God delights in you, you know, and there needs to be somebody in the building who can say that to them. And, and, and so, I'll be that person. So Dr. Jones, can I, I first of all, I, I, might I make a statement? Um, somebody put in the chat, we want to go to your church, Dr. Naomi. That's, <laughs> that's, that's me too. <laughs> when is the service? What time? Uh, I, 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 that so resonates with me personally, because I would say, um, there are a lot of us that are in the machine that really struggle. I, you know, I, I, I get emotional saying this because I, 
I don't know. So I'm going to answer this two ways. It has been a struggle staying. My, my mentor, uh, Reverend Edwin Sanders, uh, some years ago, he and I had a, a lunch because I was done. Uh, I, I couldn't, like Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas said, this institution was too toxic and I'm in the machine. I'm, and, and that was the, the greater problem is I'm, I, I, I felt a part of the problem and I'm trying to liberate myself and others from the problem with, from within the problem. And I, I, it is hard to stay. It is difficult. It is complicated to preach from a text that was used to kill me. That's just the truth. That's, that's my truth. It, it, um, and I'm a pastor. <laughs> I, I pastor pastors and I have such a tough time staying in this thing. Um, I have so many issues. I, 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 I my church, I, I said this to my church, um, I, I was on my way to perform Shahada. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I, just, I was going to go to a Friday meeting. I, I, but the truth is, I was just trying to find something else, any, anything else. It didn't even matter. And I am in the middle of the machine. And, and the tension was tough. But I will say one experience gave me a nudge, I don't know. I had a member that was 22. He, and this circles back to um, HIV. He had full blown AIDS. <sighs> a very dear uh, member of our church and In ICU, they had just, um, I guess he was doing a little better, but not. And I grabbed his hand uh, and he turned to me and he said, Pastor, am I going to hell? I couldn't even... You don't have an opportunity to do a workshop or a class or a seminary session or, dis, or deconstruct the Bible or decolonize the text or you don't have time. As the pastor, you, don't, you, you understand what I'm saying, y'all? He said to me, am I going to hell? And he gave me that look that said, I need you to tell me this now, right now. I need to know now. And as I am answering him and trying to say, absolutely not. And then I'm saying, I have, for the time you've been a part of this church, we have reinforced this idea that God loves you and God cares about you and you are perfect, you are just enough. Whether you are religious or not, it don't even matter. As I am saying this, he slipped away. Absolutely away. And I stood there in absolute terror because I'm sitting in the problem of the theology and the reality of pastoral psychology and pastoral ministry and my own personal bullshit as a pastor, of, of all, all of the questions, all the layers. And it dawned on me, I gotta stay. I gotta stay. I, I don't even wanna stay. And I don't even know what I'm staying in, but I know what the, the context of, of this Y'all don't hear me. This reality, this, this, this thing that has just happened. And I'm grabbing somebody who's slipping away. He slipped away. He, not the body. He. 
in the middle of the in the middle of the sermon, right? In the middle of the thing. I realized I had to stay. For me, and I and I I don't encourage anymore people to stay. Hear my point. Because I think what's more important is to help people actualize their own spirituality. Because the idea of church is dead anyway. But that's another, let's have that session a few weeks from now. It's my, it's my opinion. I'm, it's, my, it, it's me talking. I think the thing has been dead, but that's another thing. I'm saying that I realize whatever this thing is, I got to stay in the room. I don't have to sit on the couch. I can stay next to the door, but I got to stay in the room. I want to thank you for that, Bishop Allen. That's a heavy place you were in. And uh, that touched me. And I knew it touched a whole lot of people because, and this is why we do the work that we do, those of us that are here, because we know there's plenty plenty, plenty members of the LGBTQ community who are ask, still asking that question, am I going to hell? And that's why we do the work that we do to try to tell somebody, you ain't going to hell. It don't exist. What are you talking just, about? Just, just because of who, come on. <laughs> and the matter of the churches, you know, I tell my students, I'm doing the bit I can do here in schools of theology. The institutional church may die, and well, it should. But the church of Jesus Christ shall live in us, through us, and the works that we do. Let that thing die. It needs to die. It's messy. It's hurt too many people, you know. But there, there can be a resurgence of what God loves. And finally, I will say this about young people. I'm getting old, y'all, and I, I've had to deal with that. Naomi calls me auntie, and I've had to embrace that. I want to stay young for a long time, but it, it, it you know, the, the numbers just not working with me. And through the pandemic, I had to say to myself, Lightsey, what are you going to do for a young generation of theologians, activists, LGBTQ persons who love justice and want to do justice? What are you going to do? Are you going to take all your goods and sit down? Or are you really going to try to help, help an up and coming and emerging generation who will do, continue to do the work, not carry the torch? I have no torch to pass, but the work has already been established for us. And so Right now, I've turned my attention. I think the best thing I can do for a new generation, a young generation, is to tell them, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. I want to be, a, I want to be one of them elders that's so sweet and so nice. I want to be so sweet and so nice and so approachable. And I want to be, I want to be crotchety here and there. I want to be petty. I'm going to maintain some pettiness. But I want to be approachable. So if you got a question about how did you do this? You know, you can come to me and I'll, I'll tell you what I, what I think or what I went through or walk it through with you. I'm not going to tell you how to do stuff, but I'll, I'll talk with you through options for your life. That's, I think, what we need, we, us older folks, we need to let shit go and recognize that this work does not revolve around us. And it's, gonna, it's enough evil in this world to keep a whole two, three, four generations up and coming doing a work long after we're gone. But right now, I think what my task is for a younger generation is to be here for them and to encourage them and to try to help prepare them for the days and the years to come and to let shit, let it go, let it go. You know, too many, too many arrogant preachers out there, too many arrogant theologians out there think everything revolve around everything, no. You know, there are many more books that will be written. You haven't written the, the best that, that, that will ever be. Their minds being shaped. Other people will come by. Your, my task is to make room for and to love someone into loving someone else. Amen to that. Um, 
go ahead, jump in. No, I just, uh, and, and I'm aware of the time. So uh, just briefly, yes, uh, amen to that. And, you know, Bishop Allen, thank you for sharing that. And what it reminds me, and, and I, and yes, reminds all of us of, I think, is again, that we aren't talking about abstract notions of, of theology. Uh, we aren't, uh, we're talking about that which really kills people. Uh, uh, and that impacts people's lives. And I just think we need to be clear about this, that, you know, whatever taboo ish, taboos we have around discourses of sexuality, uh, whatever uh, hesitancies, and that's putting it mildly, uh, that we have about affirming uh, all of those who have breath or have ever had breath, we need to see in those that we disavow uh, and in these discussions that we don't have, we need to see the impact that it has on those who would be and are our children, right? And, uh, you know, I think of the Nigel Shelby's of the world, a young teenager uh, down some right that uh, who killed himself uh, because of the bullying that he received in school as a, a queer person. Uh, uh, our churches should be sanctuaries uh, and should provide the kind of affirmation of who they are by virtue of the fact that God already affirmed them because God created them. So for me, uh, Dr. Jones, what makes this conversation important is because we aren't talking about abstract realities, we're talking about real people's lives. And we're talking about the way in which theology kills uh, uh, from the inside out and the outside in. And so we need to take this work seriously, have these conversations. We may not have all the answers, but we do know that uh, uh, God calls us into life, not into death. And we are to be arbiters of life, not death. Uh, and let's just, let's take that seriously. And you started us on this path by talking about HIV AIDS, the church and its, its uh, uh, death dealing theology killed many of people uh, who uh, from uh, during the HIV AIDS crisis and continues to do so because we can't reckon with uh, the matter of sexuality and we uh, have yet to catch up with God. And that's all I wanted to say that I'm just sitting here thinking this matters and it's not abstract. Uh, it's about people's lives. And the moment we put a sacred canopy over something, it is hard as uh, Dr. Naomi is reminded, it's hard to dislodge. Uh, and so anyway, that's, uh, thank you for this conversation. I don't have a solution except that these conversations have to continue and, and we cannot stay silent while we see people's lives being decimated by what's going on under the name of God. That's so true. And you've actually started to answer the last question that I was gonna to pose to all panelists. Um, and that's how do we harness the power of black activism and black faith communities to meaningfully address HIV and AIDS uh, and the stigma that still exists in black communities related to HIV and AIDS. And I think uh, Dr. Brown Douglas has already started to sort of respond to that. Uh, and we may not have the answers, but each panelist, if you would, just share with us, how do you think we can harness this power of our, we have a long history of Black activism, right? That's been mobilized in, in Black church contexts. So I, how do we harness that for, for addressing this issue? I, I would say, um, I think first the Black church has to stop seeing itself as the premier authority of Black activism. 
you know, this narrative that the black church led the civil rights movement, um, that it is the premier authority on social movement within the black community. Um, whether that's true or not, we, we got to reimagine. And I think see ourselves as more so as partners, not as leaders. You know, people are not coming to Bible study, but they will go to a Black Lives Matter movement meeting. <laughs> they will go to a rally. You know, I think this generation is more prone to do that. And so if, if Black faith leaders of all hues, um, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, uh, atheists, agnostics, all of us who practice any form of anything would see us as one with, I, I love the illustration that, that you gave uh, Dr. Kelly, you know, so, you know, the art bending towards justice, but of course, when you say arc, I, I thought arc, you know, Noah, <laughs> that really we're on, we're on the same boat. We're on the same arc. We are on the same thing. We are one. And in terms of our liberation and our freedom, uh, I think we, if we harness our, the, the energy of our collaboration, we will bring change. Ab the abolitionist movement, while it was complicated, it really understood the currency of collaboration. It understood that. It understood that no one person can provide the, the, the freedom that was needed uh, for, for an enslaved people. And I believe if we come together, then, then the energy we, we are able to harness, the, the passion we're able to harness that. Naomi, what, what are your thoughts? What are your closing thoughts about how do we harness the power of Black activism and faith communities? You know, I completely agree with what Bishop just said about how the movement is, the train has left the station. And so it's a question of, do we want to follow other folk leadership, right? Um, do we want to participate in a movement where we are not given the microphone? Um, where we don't make all of the decisions about what will happen, right? Um, do we take seriously that, um, that you know, the, the children will lead us? Do we take that seriously? Talking about the Bible. I mean, do we take seriously that um, we are not the experts in the room? Um, so, I think some some humility is required to say we don't know what we need to know <laughs> and we are in recovery from the ways in which we paved the way for so much of this pain and suffering and death. Um, we are here to follow, um, not to, to give orders but to take them. And, you know, I also think um, Back to Dr. Brown Douglas's point about, and, and Dr. Lighty's point about relationships, right? So many of our ecclesial communities are not in any kind of meaningful, more than transactional relationships with people who are living with HIV, you know? And so there's an intimacy problem. Um, and so I don't know what the movement needs us if we don't even have relationships that are worth something. And so there's just, there's just some, some groundwork we need to do um, to be ready to participate in the movement that has already begun without us. Um, so I think if we can do that groundwork, right, it'll be clearer to us what lane we should be in and how we can best contribute uh, to the movement. Dr. Lysi. You have a last word. 
I, I thank all my colleagues for what they've already said. And I say amen to all of that. You know, as a um, scholar, uh, academic dean, I'm in the business of educating and helping to equip leaders uh, for a world that very often does not want them in the midst. And yet it's important to have that education. I think one of the most important things we can do is to shine is to do the work that shines the light on that which is killing us. And um, our, I mean, the independent independent black churches began as what is called freedom movement, standing up to and shining the light on not only that which was killing black people, people of African descent, but also shining the light on those things that were were killing white people down through the civil rights movement on through black lives the movement for black lives is shining the light on evil wherever it exists and it takes someone it takes some people who are willing to do the hard work to educate themselves so that they have the language to help other people see what the real evil is. And we are living in an age where gaslighting is taking place, where the big lie is taking place. I mean, right now, I mean, uh, an attack against uh, vote, voter suppression is happening. Um, uh, the ability of women to say what will be with their bodies is happening. Uh, the attack against uh, LGBTQ persons one will go on and on and on with attacks against humanity. And if we do not see this grasp for power and control and the greed that comes with capitalism as the chief sources of evil, and we don't educate ourselves on how to combat it, we will always be harmed. And so we need to lock arms with one another be in solidarity against one another, because it is true. If they come for me, they'll come for you. So this is not just about the Black, L, uh, about the LGBTQ community or the Black LGBTQ community, because the disease that is HIV AIDS knows no boundaries when it comes to identities. It will come for you. And so we have to have those things in place to help combat it and also to help continue to combat discrimination. Wow. Let me say thank you to all of our panelists on this evening uh, for participating in this very, very important uh, panel discussion on Black sexuality, the church and living faith uh, hosted by the Wake Forest School of Divinity Faith Coordinating Center. Um, it is that work that we hope to do, to harness the power of Black activism, activism and Black faith communities, to build capacities of congregations to be able to make a difference and address HIV and AIDS in the South. That's what our mission is, and that's what we hope to do. We are so glad that you all have joined us in that mission. Um, want to give people an opportunity in the, in the live stream as well as in the chat to be able to uh, thank our panelists for their time and energy and, and care in sharing with us on this evening. And also want to invite our uh, listeners and our followers to, um, to look, up, look us up in the work that we're doing at, for the Faith Coordinating Center. Uh, you can follow us at Faith Compass WFU uh, on Facebook and on Instagram and on Twitter. Uh, we hope that you will join this important work because as uh, many of our panelists have said, uh, this, is a, this is a matter of life and death. Um, and we choose life, right? We choose life. Um, and we choose to try to catch up with God, right? So to all of those who have gathered and assembled with us on this evening, thank you for your time and your energy. God bless. <laughs>